Hello everybody, welcome back. Um, today's lesson is going to be how to uh, promote parameters on procedurals coming from Substance Designer to be used in Substance Painter. Um, this is going to be sort of like a uh, beginner to some kind of intermediate features. Um, but I thought it would be useful to cover like um, what sort of parameters you should promote um, once you finish building a, a material or a procedural in designer and what's useful and what's not because um, you can definitely overcook it or undercook it. So um, uh, yeah, let's just dive straight into it. I'll try and keep this video a bit quicker this time. I think the last video was getting close to an hour, so we'll we'll see how fast we can get through this. So. Um, I've made this uh, procedural iris generator, which is similar to what I uh, showcased on my uh, Mumbler character, um, which is now up on ArtStation. So I've re rebuilt this uh, procedural quickly this morning, um, so it's not quite got the same feature set, but this doesn't have any promoted parameters um, to be used in Substance Painter yet. So, so what we'll do is um, we'll just cover uh, how I built the procedural really quick um, and then we'll start adding useful parameters on top of it. Um, so uh, so just going through the start, I kind of started with this um, cell noise pattern knowing that I wanted to get some kind of strands and this kind of, I could see this pattern in this top level layer here. So um, I started with that, um, I'm just doing like a basic slope blur to give it some, some fall off so it feels kind of radial, like this kind of thing. Um, and I'm adding some noise over the top of it so it's um, kind of, you know, undulating and it's not just completely flat um, in height. And I'm warping it a little bit just to give some organicness to the strands and warping it a little bit more. So I've just got two different noises here. One's using the warp node. The other one's using the slope blur node. So two kind of different um, warps there. But you get the idea is kind of like, or, you know, taking the strands and making it more organic from this hard sort of cellular pattern there. So um, um and then the next bit basically is where all the um, action happens. It's actually a really simple material. It's only that big. So um, it'll get a little bit bigger when we add some um, parameters in there with switches and things. But um, yeah, it's actually pretty simple. So uh, I've got an auto levels um, coming out here just to make sure I'm using all the range. Um, and then... I'm adding a slope blur here with a radial that I'm reusing uh, for the next step as well. So the reason I'm doing this is to get some dimensionality into the top level strands so that they feel thick when it's layered up on top of the, the finer level strands. So um, yeah, it's kind of a cool thing. It actually looks cool by itself. Like that in itself could be a um, an interesting procedural for painter. <laughs> um, so yeah, same deal, I'm using a slope blur with a radial, it's just been scaled up so I can get the um, kind of fall off I want. And then at that point I'm splitting it into two streams, which uh, this top stream is like the larger top layer strands, and then this bottom stream here is the finer strands. So um, to do this is pretty easy, I'm using the same uh, radial um, inside of a warp node. Uh, you get this kind of weird almost like 8-bit artifacting, um, which I've asked the guys, maybe there's another way to prevent that from happening. Um, if there is, maybe like chuck it in the comments below as well if you know a way, but um, basically I just blur it to get around it for the moment till I've found a better way. Um, and now what I'm doing here, and this is something we'll talk about when we get to promoting up the parameters, is that... Uh, we're going to control the intensity values um, of the stretching uh, based off one value, but it will output two different parameters using an expression. So we'll we'll cover that. Um, but yeah, so basically uh, walking through the chain still. Uh, so the top layer, I'm blurring it. Bottom layer, I'm blurring it just to get rid of that artifacting. 
doing a bit of a levels adjustment on the top layer to thicken it up a little bit. And that's something we're going to promote as part of the parameters. Um, on the bottom here, I'm using an effects map node, um, which we'll get into once we start promoting the parameters as well. But basically this um, just layers things up. So we're going to use this as a layer control. Um, next back on the top, I'm just scaling this up a little bit so that I can have these strands bigger than the smaller strands underneath. Um, I'll get back to that after as well. That'll be a, um, a cool little extra that we'll talk about at the end. Um, and then I'm just using a shape node with a blur to, um, you know, subtract out uh, the center iris so that you get this kind of ring um, here for the thick layer. And the bottom, I'm actually not doing that. Um, so I've got a levels here. Um, and then blending it back together. And this way you can kind of see what's happening already. Uh, the levels I'm using to very deliberately sit the strands underneath the top level, uh, thicker strands. That's kind of looking at, you know, photographs and stuff. That's, that's what happens. So I've tried to mimic that here. Um, and then, yeah, just basic edge controls here to, um, you know, add a bit of a radial soft fall off. Um, and the last control, which is the pupil in subtract mode. So you still get some nice edges and things. So, um, yeah, really kind of simple. It took me about, I don't know, an hour to rebuild at home. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. If you want to try and have a go at building this yourself, now you know how I kind of approached it. And um, the way I like to preview this stuff in the viewport when I'm working is I follow... Um, uh, Wes from Allegrythmics got some really wicked um, tutorials up on Substance Academy. So if you follow any of his tutorials, he'll talk about this workflow where he will use a base material applied to uh, a grid and then using a normals ambient occlusion and height um, and sort of think about this process as a modeling process. And I really like this workflow. Like it's, it's super simple. It gives you exactly what you need to see and you can just kind of focus, um, you know, having this, this nice sort of modeling template. So yeah, I really like that approach. So definitely check out his videos on Substance Academy for more info on that. But, um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about what parameters we think are going to be useful for a material like this if you wanted to um, to distribute this out. So I guess, first of all, I'll, um, I'll try and tighten up my terminology a little bit. Um, so we're not going to output this as a material as such. We're going to output this as a procedural noise pattern. So if it was a material type, it would have different components like uh, you know, diffuse roughness, normals, and all that sort of thing. Um, that would be a material. In this case, this is going to be a procedural, the same way as like a pearl in noise or um, something like that. So if we look in here, um, we're basically, we're going to make the iris into one of these guys, a, a noise procedural. Um, so let's talk about first what I like to do before um, even thinking about parameters. I, I tend to like build everything, just get the picture, and then I'll think about afterwards what would be useful. So um, I tend to just write down a little list of things that I think would be useful and then I start from there. So the list I have um, for this guy is, uh, so we'll create some pupil uh, size control um, and the edge fall off control. Uh, we'll create uh, some strand uh, width control. So um, yeah, that's the width of these guys and these guys. Um, we'll add some controls for the layering. So this top layer, this bottom layer. Um, and then lastly, we'll add some like effects style controls, um, which is where we'll come back to, um, with these nodes in here. So things like the amount of radial stretching and that sort of thing would also be useful if you wanted to create more like, um, something that wasn't so human, more like alien like, um, or even something abstract, um, whilst, you know, maintain the flexibility to be able to do other things with this. Maybe you don't want to make an iris, you could use it for something completely different. So um, that's kind of a good amount of control to start with. So 
Um, now that we've got kind of a list of goals that we want to achieve, we basically um, can start diving in and, and finding where we could add those controls and um, how to set up the parameters, pane and grouping and that sort of thing. So let's start with the uh, pupil and uh, edge size control because that's the easiest or at the front and I've already left some some room for some switches to be able to turn them off as part of the layering as well. So let's just start with the size of the pupil. So uh, the pupil's built using a shape node and it's just got a, a blur to um, soften the edge which is what we're seeing in here. So the shape node already has this size parameter so we can basically just start there. So if we jiggle this guy we can see that that's that's pretty much doing exactly what we want to do so so let's promote that up to a parameter so the way we do this is that there's this little icon here um, which is manage the function which controls this parameter so if we click here we've got a couple of options as expose create an empty empty function or a constant value so we'll cover functions in one of the other parameters um, in a little bit, but for the moment with this one, we just want to expose it. So I'm going to click the expose button and it says, what, what name do you want? So you can leave it as size and rename it afterwards, or you can name it now. Uh, it's kind of, um, I definitely do half, half. Sometimes if I'm in a rush, I just leave it and I'll rename everything afterwards. Sometimes if I want to be neat, I'll just name it on the fly. If it's some of these parameter names don't promote up to a, kind of uh, intuitive name, I guess, or like something that artists won't recognize. So some, I'll just rename it instantly. But for the moment, let's just click OK. So we can see now this scale slider um, has disappeared. Um, this is now glowing blue, and this indicates that this, this parameter is now being driven uh, elsewhere, and it's going to be on the primary uh, parameters tab. So if we click on the node graph icon, we've got this tab here called input parameters. And basically uh, this is going to be the location for all of our parameters that get promoted up. Um, and then when we bring this into Substance Painter, this is uh, what's going to be represented um, as our controls. So we can see here it's called scale, which was the name that came up when we um, first click to uh, expose the parameter and it gave us that tab with an option. So, but if we expand this, we can just totally rename it now, or you can leave it as is and just rename the label and that sort of thing. And it gives us some pretty standard controls. You can add a description for what this control is going to do, which is always a good idea. So um, controls the size of the inner pupil. Cool. Um, because we've promoted this up, it's already grabbed the type of parameter that we're working with. You could change this if you wanted to, but you, you probably break the parameter it's linked to. But um, you can also make these parameters in advance rather than promoting them. So you can preemptively do that and then link them back up afterwards. But I find this way is um, a lot easier. So uh, the label is what uh, the parameter is going to be called. So um, we're going to name this pupil size. Um, the group is kind of like the top folder uh, role, which I'll show you in just a second um, when we preview how this is going to look. And then we have the default uh, value for the parameter. So by it, it's cool. It grabs whatever you had set. It keeps that as the default. So at the moment I've got 0 0.27 as the default. So we can just leave that. And then we can choose to set the minimum and maximum value that's allowed on this parameter. And we can either clamp that or um, leave it unlocked so that users can go above the max value if they choose to. So um, We'll cover how to preview this straight away um, just while we're in the simplest form with one parameter. So um, previewing allows you to visualize exactly how this is going to look in Substance Painter with all this stuff kind of hidden off. Um, and the way to do that is this little sort of eye icon. If we click this, 
this is now going to show us um, what it's going to look like. So you can see the label of the parameter that we renamed is called pupil size. If you hover over it, it gives you the um, help that we entered in the notes. And we can drag this to test that it works, which it does. So we can drag this all the way to zero. Um, we can drag this all the way to one, which completely obliterates the, <laughs> the whole procedure. So um, say for example, let's, let's enable the clamp function on this. Um, so one cool thing about this as well is um, if you adjust this parameter and just leave it like this and then untick the preview mode, it's going to reset back to your default. So when in preview mode, you can completely jiggle all your parameters test them all out and just unclick and it'll all just reset. So you don't have to worry about like kind of screwing up any default values and things like that. It'll, it'll just all reset, which is heaps useful. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm going to clamp this value. I'm going to say, uh, actually, let's go back to a preview. I'm going to find a value that I don't want to go above. So let's say maybe like there, uh, maybe even less. Maybe, let's say 0.4, okay. So I'm gonna go back and set this to 0.4 and I've got clamp enabled. And the minimum, let's say we wanted to keep this like somewhat, I don't know, real, um, if you didn't wanna have this infinitely, um, you know, remove itself. So I'll go back here, if we go here, so now you can see the minimum size is there and the maximum size is there and the sliders adjusted itself accordingly so so that's um yeah that's useful it's pretty self-explanatory and this can be useful if you're setting up materials if you've got um kind of sensitive parameters um where if you push it too far it'll break so you can actually block users from from changing this if i untick false you'll see that the slider is still respecting um the values that we put in, um, but I can actually go above this. So even though that says 0.4, I can type in 0.8 and the slider will readjust. So we're not clamped. It'll actually allow us to go above that value, which is useful as well, um, but can be difficult to know if a parameter is unlocked or not. Um, so you kind of have to experiment. Um, I know some of the, like, especially if you work in designer, you already know that like some of the parameters um, can go above one, but which ones you don't know until you try. So yeah, it's kind of, um, yeah. But in this case, I'm just gonna lock it and um, we'll, we'll move on. So, so that's the first one. So control the pupil size. Now let's control the outer edge size. So that's gonna be exactly the same thing. Um, we have a scale parameter here. I'm gonna expose it. Now, here's where it gets, um, this is where this gets useful. So you can see we already have this parameter size and size one. So we don't wanna select size because that's then gonna control two values at the same time. We wanna create a new input name so that we have a second parameter. So we don't want the, that slider to control both things at the moment. Um, so now if we go back to here, um, so now we can see we have another scale parameter again, it's called scale one. So I'm gonna call this uh, edge all off. Oops. And the label, I'm just gonna call it edge all off. We're gonna clamp it and let's have a preview of that, see what it does. Well, oh, once again, it can infinitely kind of collapse and we can go all the way to the edge, which isn't super useful because it's, it's going to clip the material. So what we can do, let's find, say 0 0.9, 0 0.9 and maybe like 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0.5. Okay, so the max. 0.9, the minimum is 0.5. Now we can see we've got our pupil control and edge ball control. Yep. 
Cool. So that stuff's pretty pretty simple, and you can go through and start kind of finding, um, you know, simple things like that, depending on how you build it. Um, you can get a lot of control really quickly, and it, it's quite easy to promote this this stuff up um, rather than just kind of keeping it in designer and you know, exporting just flattened bitmaps from here. You may as well, like, you've got all this control, you may as well promote stuff up and get it into Painter and then um, keep it procedural and then other artists can can use it and, you know, you can continually add to it and build on top of it and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's really wicked. So the next thing on the list we had was control the strand width. So the way I'm going to do that is down at the very, very start of the chain um, on the cell procedural, we have this edge width parameter that already exists. So if I adjust that, you can see that's pretty much going to give me the control I want. It's going to make the strands thicker or thinner. So we'll do the same deal. We'll go expose. In this case, I'm going to make a new name. It gives you a prompt. So I'm going to call this strand thickness. Click OK. We'll go back to the main parameters and we can see. Now, edge width. Strange, I don't know why I called it. Ah, oh, right, yes, of course. It's inherited the label name of the original parameter. So in here, it's called edge width. So that's what it promoted the label up as as well. Um, but of course, we want to rename that. So strand thickness. So um, let's add one more parameter and then we'll talk about grouping actually let's do let's do grouping now why not so uh grouping is a way to organize um all of these parameters into like uh sub groups so with the fall off stuff um so we've got two controls that generally do a similar thing so we could we could group them together so we'll call this um we can call this group like fall off, for example. So if I put a group name here, you can see now we've got this group name, a bar, and then the parameter name. And if we preview this, you can see now we've got um, a little like drop down tab, and that's got a parameter inside of it. So if we go back, let's do this to edge fall off as well, and we'll call this fall off. We can just copy and paste it into there. Now we have two parameters under fall off. So this is really useful for grouping similar types of controls. Like in, in the case of this, you've got pupil size, fall off size. It kind of makes sense to, to keep them together. So we'll keep them together. Um, so yeah, it's all, it's all pretty straightforward. It's kind of, um, as soon as you've done this like a couple of times, it gets really easy. Um, and it gives you tons of control. So, so the next thing we're going to do is set up uh, some switches to be able to control the top and bottom layers so that we can enable and disable them. Um, and because I've got two separate streams here, it should be pretty straightforward to do. So um, what we're going to do is um, create a switch. And then we'll do the top layer first. So we're going to put this into true because um, in the parameter layout, I basically want this exact thing, but it's sort of like enable top layer. Yes. Enable bottom layer. Yes. That way, by default, they're both ticked on. If you don't want one, you can just untick it. So um, just put a uniform color down switch it to grayscale pipe that into there so we'll just make some room here and then we'll plug this one into here and what this will basically do is enable or disable the top layer um so it should be as easy as that so we'll just copy and paste that over and do the same thing for the bottom plug that in 
now we have that same control for the bottom. So pretty straightforward. So um, we'll promote these up. So if I hit expose now, you'll notice that in this drop down menu, we can't see those other parameters that we already uh, entered for the pupil size. And the reason for this is because this is a different um, data type. So essentially, uh, because this is a switch, this is a Boolean type, while the other parameters were a float type. So this menu will show you the same types of parameters rather than showing you every single parameter that you make, because once these get pretty big, you can imagine these lists get pretty big as well. So um, this helps to just kind of filter out exactly what you're working on. So because we don't have one of these already, um, we could leave it as is, but in this case, I'm going to rename it and this is going to be called and going to be called enable top layer. We'll click OK. We can see that it's now disappeared. And we're going to do the same thing for the bottom and we'll go expose. And you can see now that previous um, parameter that we've created has already popped up um, because we don't want the parameters to be shared. I'm going to create a new one and let's call this enable bottom layer. Could be called under layer, bottom layer. Naming. Uh, so. So now you can see here we've got two switch types, enable top layer and enable bottom layer. So in the label, enable top layer, and down the bottom, enable bottom layer. If we preview that, now we've got these two switches. So let's go back to the output here and preview. Lovely. So now is is basically turn it on or off. By default, they're both on, and that's just the top layer. Cool. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, we might also want to do this for the pupil and um, the outer edge control um, in case we want to make something say more abstract. So. Let's do the same thing. I mean, we could literally, we don't even need the black. We don't even need the um, uniform black color. Actually, at this point, we could just make a switch, put this into true and wire this straight into the path before. Okay. Um, expose this e again. You will edge. Okay, and here. Cool, so now we've got control over both those things, um, which is cool. So you could disable that, disable that, and say, turn the top player off. And now you've got a pretty funky, like, looking procedural in itself, which is cool. Um, or something like that, which is also cool. So you could use this for something entirely different just by adding a few really useful um, controls. So that's cool. Um, so we could also put these um, into the fall off uh, group folder. So same deal as what we did before. Let's enable top. I'll paste this into all of the groups. Now, if you want to rearrange these, you can see I've got two groups, uh, two parameters inside the group fall off, and then I have one parameter called strands, and then another bunch of parameters in the fall off um, group. If you grab here, you can see now I can just simply rearrange these. So um, when I preview this now, you can see fall off, these are all together, but say I wanted these um, above these parameters here, I can simply drag people size all the way down to the bottom and edge fall off all the way down to the bottom. And now you can see they're at the bottom and these guys are at the top. They are Yes, cool. Um, so now that we've done the layering, we've done some grouping of parameters, 
Um, we've got our strand thickness parameter. Um, let's add a couple of effects uh, parameters, which will cover um, also the uh, how to like link two parameters together, and then also do uh, set different values based on the same uh, parameter slider. So um, let's set up this effects parameter first. So what I've got in here, which is kind of trippy, is some swell control. So um, that could be useful if you wanted to do, um, yeah, some kind of um, monster, alien, something like that. Um, that could be useful. So uh, yeah, just simple swell nodes. I've got two in the same place, so I know where they are. Um, all the same deal because they're a type float. You can see now we've got a couple in there. So I'll make a new one and call this um, swell. Pretty straightforward. Boom. And go back into parameters and you can see it's taken the name from what the original parameter name was called, but it's kept the identifier name. So we can call this um, swell. Preview that. Kind of like James Bond, 007. So um, now that that's done, let's say we want that parameter to control uh, both the top and the bottom layer. Um, like it, it totally would be cool to keep them independent, but just for the purpose of this video, I'll, I'll show you how to link them. So now that we have this drop down menu here and we've got this parameter, if we select one that already exists and hit OK and then go back now, preview this. So we have one slider but this one slider is now controlling two nodes instead of one. So um, yeah, so it's really easy if you want one slider to just control both nodes to do the same thing. Um, so that's cool. So we'll just we'll just leave that as it is for the moment. Like if I was building this um, for you, so I'd definitely keep them independent so you could have them like different directions and stuff. That'd be pretty cool. But um, now I've got another example of that same scenario, except I want one slider to control two um, resulting sort of values. So um, what I've got here is a warp node, which um, is creating the kind of uh, radial stretching to create the organic shape. And for the two streams, I've got two values. So this top stream is being uh, warped by a value of 50 and this bottom stream is being warped by a value of 100. But I want a slider um, that can automatically um, set both values. And the way we can do this is by using the function, um, the, the function nodes um, inside here. So, so to start with, um, I'll set up a parameter the same way as before by exposing it and make a new one. And I'm going to call this radial stretching, stretch, jaw, radial stretching. Um, we'll jump back into here. We'll test it. Very good. Um, cool. And um, now the next thing we're going to do is explore uh, the functions. Um, so in here, um, rather than going expose or selecting one of the existing parameters in there, I'm going to create an empty function. Now what this does, you can see by default, it's already in an error state because um, there's actually, if you click here, this will take us into a new node graph, which is the function node graph. And we can do all sorts of cool stuff in here that will feed um, into this parameter's value. So the first thing we need to do is reach out and grab the uh, parameter that we already set that we want to use as the driver. So the way we do that is go get, um, and then we need to remember what the data type was. So in this case, it was a float. So if we go get float, 
we now get this drop down list and here's all of our float parameter types um, that we can grab. So in this case, I want it to be radial stretch. So if I select that and then um, something you have to do with these graphs is you have to set an output point. It doesn't know because you could have a bunch of nodes here. It doesn't know which one you want to use as the final output. So before we do anything, I'll right click on the node and you can see there's this option here called set as output node. So if I set that, you can see this has gone orange color and now it's picking up the value. So essentially this is exactly the same as linking the two values together, but now we can do stuff on top of here. So going back and previewing it, we'll just check the parameter again. So they are both stretching at the same time. Now that's cool. But I actually want the inner strands to stretch twice as much as the outer strands. So this is really easy. So I'm going to take a multiply node. And I'm going to make a float value. <coughs> And I basically want to say whatever value this is, I want to times that value by two. I'm going to wire this up here. Now, if I right click and set as output, voila. So now you can see we have an incoming value. I think it was 50. Let's go and double check that. Yes, so this default um, value is 50. So that's what this node essentially is. Um, and then we're timesing that value by two and setting that as our output for that parameter. So that means this value is going to equal a hundred. So, um, now I've got one parameter that drives two, two nodes in kind of two different ways. Obviously, being a multiplier, like if I set this to 100, that's now going to go to um, 200. But for this example, that is totally fine. Um, so once again, we'll name these, and I'll call this group effects. And radial stretch under group effects. And we'll preview that. Cool. So now we have that. Um, we could also use a function on this parameter here to automatically make the um, the two layers like inverse themselves if that's what you wanted. Um, yeah, I mean, like the possibilities are endless with that sort of control. It's really cool. Um, and then yeah, the radial stretch. So. That gives us some pretty decent control. All right, and the last parameter we'll promote, um, so this video doesn't drag on too long, um, is I'm using an effects node to uh, create the underside layer, which is this guy here. And the reason I've done this is because I want to be able to have a parameter that says how many iterations of layering do I want. And so I won't um, I won't dive too deep into the effects map node just yet, but this is like the this is a really basic setup that's super powerful. It's cool. So um, so I've got a node here called iterations, um, and you can see if I drag this down, um, zero iterations, you get nothing. Um, one iteration will give you one input. Uh, Two iterations will give you two copies over the top of each other and so on and so on and so on. So by default, I've got this set to six, which I just thought looked cool. <laughs> um, and then there's this, this quadrant node. So I'm using the quadrant node in its most basic way, which is um, I'm controlling the blending that the iterations are happening. Um, and then I have a function on random rotation. So basically what, what this does is that for every iteration that comes in, it randomly rotates the image around the center. 
and then the blending mode set to max. You can also set it to like, um, you know, add subtract um, or alpha blend, but in this case, I just want it to be max. Um, and inherit random. So this is where the function comes in. So on rotation, um, I've just got a constant value feeding a random node. It's pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> um, but it's cool because something that simple means that I can take a pattern, feed it into this node, iter create as many layered iterations as I want, and I'll just randomly rotate it per iteration. So you can kind of see as it layers up, you can see it kind of spinning. Um, and the more I add, you can actually see it like spinning around, which is cool. Um, and then random seed as well will randomize the, the rotation value because we've got a random node inside the function. So that is also cool. Um, so yeah, really, really simple. And um, what we're going to do is promote that iterations parameter. Okay. So we're going to have to create a parameter um, from here and then link it back up, which is super easy. So what we'll do, there's this plus button here. So we'll hit plus and to type float, but in this case, because it's an iteration, we want integer. So we're going to select integer one. I uh, want it to be a slider. I'm going to call this iterations. Um, and for a friendly user name, let's call this strand layer amount. Cool. And I'm going to clamp it at 10 and 1 because if you put it at 0, it'll disappear. And we'll put the default to 6. Okay, so now that we have this here, um, uh, we can jump back to this node here. Go to our iterations function. We can actually delete this now. And same thing, we're going to go get integer. We're going to find the parameter that we just made, which is called iterations. And we're going to set this as the output node. Lovely. And we'll preview that. So now we have strand layer amount. And we can use this to layer up however many strands uh, we want in the material. So 10 strands, six strands. So um, yeah, so let's, um, we'll just leave it there for designer and we'll pull this into painter quickly and just test all these uh, parameters in painter. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward to promote these parameters and it's definitely um, being selective about what you want to promote to get the most bang for the buck out of the material. You don't want to over parameterize it because then it gets too slow um, or you get controls that start to contradict themselves and things like that. So when you're building this stuff, my advice would be to, uh, before you promote anything, um, think about what functionality you want and think about the most, the least amount of controls that can um, create the results that you're looking for and write a bit of a list um, to help um, go through what you're actually about to do. Uh, All right, so um, I've just quickly renamed uh, a few of the groups and things just to make it a little bit more uh, organized. Uh, now we're going to export this as a procedural to use in Substance Painter. And the way we do that is really easy. We just select the um, the top uh, designer file. I don't quite know what you call them. Package? Substance. Substance? Sure. Um, and we're going to go publish SBS AR file. So save as just saves the um, the package for designer, as you know, but when you actually want to export this, you have to um, publish it. So we're going to hit publish. Um, and it's going to ask where we want it to go. Going to put it there. And then it comes up with this. Um, this warning found graph with non-relative parent, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. I think I fixed the bit depth to always be 16-bit. I can't 
remember what that was, but um, compression mode, I haven't really um, changed that so far. You can have an icon if you want. Um, and these are some extra kind of global parameters if you want to expose them. So in this case, we do want random seed because random seed will change the whole, uh, any parameter that has a random seed, this is like a global button that will uh, randomize each parameter. So we definitely want that. So we're gonna click okay. It's going to do that. And now we're gonna jump over to Substance Painter. So let's go over here. So I've just got Matt up with um, some super basic materials and I've got the shelf here, all the other procedurals. And I wanna load the procedural in that we just created. So the way we do this is we go file, import resource. And then it gives you this menu and we're gonna go add resources. Okay, so I've selected the, um, the SBSAR file that we just exported. And now I'm gonna select a type. So the type I want is a procedural. Um, and you can add a prefix to it if you wanna find it easily as well. Um, and as usual, you've got these options. You can do the current section, uh, session, you can do it for the project, or you can add it to your shelf. So while I'm testing, I generally just bring it into the current session. And then once I'm happy with it, then I'll move it into the shelf. So we'll click import. And now you can see down the bottom here, it's loaded in, it's called Iris. Um, so let's make a, let's make a fill layer and we'll add a mask and it could just be white for the moment, that's fine. We'll add a fill and we'll drag and drop this guy in. Ah uh, yes, Matt's face is not in the middle it's about there. Get <laughs> um, this down and we'll just set this to not repeat. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there's our custom procedural that we made in designer, we promoted it up and imported it for use into Painter. And down here we can see the controls that we made. So we'll just test that they all work. So the layer, yes, um, yes. And because we're not live in Painter, uh, sorry, in Designer anymore, this is much faster to um, to work with, which is cool. So you can see these layers are pretty pretty responsive now. So kind of trippy if we actually turn that off. It's like a pretty interesting look in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's quite cool in itself. No. Um, so we've got the iterations using the effects node that we made. Um, we can control the edge fall off. We can control the pupil size. Control how thick the strands are. Oh wow, it's really cool. Um, we can control the radial stretching. Huh, now that's interesting. It's defaulted back to one, even though it was set to 50. Don't know why that is. Uh, let's check that in designer in a second. We'll set it to 50. Ah, doesn't like it. Interesting. i bomb that and make it again. Oh, it says radial stretch is set to one, but it's actually 50. Huh, that is weird. To look into why that happened, but um, yes, you get the idea and the swirl control. Um, I actually remap this, so it just goes between one and one, so it's not too crazy. You can see that there as well. And like I said, uh, using the shared, um, functions you know i could have these going opposite directions and that sort of thing the principle to set all that stuff up is all the same so um yeah so i hope that has helped you guys get started with kind of um getting out of designer and back into painter um and the kind of possibilities that it opens up because i mean like it's really easy and i really see this is kind of 
this is where the the power lies now is is joining the two softwares together um so yeah let me know if um <clears throat> you want me to do more of these kinds of videos like li the link between designer and painter i'm definitely going to be doing more designer tutorials the more i'm, I'm getting a lot more comfortable with it now so i'm just, um yeah i'll plan to do some designer tutorials from scratch to to show you guys how i kind of approach procedurals and and that sort of thing and um yeah i'll see you in the next one bye